I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I'd like to talk with you about what you may have experienced some of in the meditation, which is the felt knowing of the truth of things in terms of our interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh put it, our dependence upon a whole field of relationship for our existence, moment to moment, including our consciousness, moment to moment. While your body and mind are, in a sense, local, and we think in reference to something that's local, which, which matters, it, the body exists, the person has a body-mind process with some continuity exists, and yet when we feel separated and isolated and beleaguered, oh, it's painful, isn't it? And on the other hand, when we start having softer edges, and more of a sense of living out into everything and being lived by everything, our heart softens, we calm, and it can feel even awestruck and ecstatic to, to experience the truth of things in this way. So I'd like to explore this with you, mainly through uh, quoting uh, wiser people than me, uh, including in a moment John Muir, and also sharing a bit of my own writing about this, and then really opening it up for your exploration of what helps you feel more supported by all that is, which is especially important, I think, these days, as we often feel understandably let down by so many things that are. Um, or um, attacked or threatened um, by so many things that are. And when we feel let down, uh, including by other human beings, or when we feel uh, threatened or attacked, including by an invisible plague, uh, it's, or invisible to the naked eye, uh, the coronavirus, um, it's natural to contract and to hunker down. And yet in that contraction is a lot of suffering and it's harder to think clearly and act effectively. Uh, it's especially important when forces are around us that tend to trigger us into contraction and separation and isolation that we rest in and we come back to and we have value and practice the Buddha's teachings and the teachings of other wise beings, including a quantum physicist, that, that we are relational in our very being, breath after breath, moment after moment. So to begin, I would like to quote John Muir, who said, the sun, the sun shines not on us, but in us. The rivers flow not past, but through us. Thrilling, tingling, vibrating every fiber and cell of the substance of our bodies, making them glide and sing. This is John Muir, the great naturalist. The trees wave and the flowers bloom in our bodies, as well as our souls. And every bird song, wind song, and tremendous, soar, tremendous storm song of the rocks in the heart of the mountains is our song, our very own, and sings our love. Alan Watts, to quote him as well, wrote in one of my favorite and powerful books I read uh, in my 20s, his book, The Book, on the taboo against knowing who you are. Alan Watts writes, you didn't come into this world, you came out of it. 
like a wave from the ocean. You are not a stranger here. And this teaching, you are not a stranger here, is very heartfelt, isn't it? It's very touching because what both John Muir and then 150 years later or so, Alan Watts are getting at is that we are at home in the field of relationships, whether it's the air we inhale from the plants that exhale oxygen, or whether it's the people who have helped us and touched us, who flow through us, or whether it's in our, in our own outflowing in the world, that's our home. The conventional sense of being separated, me separate from you, in an absolute sense, is just wrong. And it's kind of full of misery, right? You know, you might want to bring this down to earth as I am right now as I speak. In your important family relationships or friend relationships or work relationships, especially with people that you have maybe difficulties with or you feel somewhat disappointed in. And to, right now, if you like, just kind of play with the imagination and the feeling of the boundary between you and them being softer, more diffuse, more permeable. Where they end and you begin, it's fuzzier. Playing with that. Not with someone who's assaulted you or abused you, you know, not going there, but with someone that's kind of okay in your world but still challenging. And what happens? When you start looking at them, regarding them as kind of like a fuzzy dynamic process with soft edges swirling and you yourself are sort of a fuzzy dynamic process with soft edges swirling and you're kind of swirling together. You're swirling into them, they're swirling into you and it's fuzzier. You, you depend more on each other. You affect each other more. You, you become, when you kind of look at things this way, you are more aware of how you affect them and they affect you and can be kinder and more skillful about that because we're in relationship with each other. Yeah. To put it a little abstractly, as Thich Nhat Hanh writes, interdependence means that a thing can arise only in reliance on other things. Huh. Just kind of imagining and or stepping back and considering your own independent life. And to, which we tend to think of as mine, right? Uh, in a context, certainly in American culture of rugged, autonomous, self-direction, independence. But to realize, wow, so much of what is I think of as mine, including this personality, this mind stream, arose entirely only in reliance on other things. <laughs> Something happens when we look at our life in that way. We realize, wow, I didn't just make myself up. I came into being like a cloud comes into being based on so many forces and factors, genetic, cultural, circumstantial, luck, good and bad, other people, other people, teachings, misfortunes, health problems, um, accidents. Um, whew. That's who you are. What happens when you regard yourself in that way as someone who came into being only in reliance on other things? This is very central in the Buddha's teaching. And if for no other reason than the Buddha thought it was important, I hope you'll hang in there with my talk tonight. Lou Richmond, wonderful Western teacher writes, three truths. That's what I'm saying. Then he says, everything is connected. Nothing lasts. You are not alone. Everything is connected. 
nothing lasts, you are not alone. If you can put up with me being a little abstract for a moment or two. First, quantum physics, about which I understand much less than I'd like to. I'll just put it like that, which probably puts me <laughs> with 99% of the population. But anyway, uh, you know this whole notion that quantum particles can be in two places at the same time until there's an observation, and then whoop, they become here or there. But meanwhile, until there's the observation, they could as likely be here or there. Or in some sense, they exist simultaneously in both places. That's one interpretation. A different interpretation is that the causes of that electron or the quarks that constitute it, the causes, the forces that make that particle, whatever it is, are dispersed in a kind of cloud. Probabilistically, some of those forces have more influence than others, but they are dispersed. And in effect, by extension, they are dispersed ultimately throughout the universe. So that as every particle comes into being, and those particles are the basis of our own physical being, the causes that bring you in, them into being and thus bring your body into being are actually distributed throughout the entire universe. Wow. That can be kind of intellectual, or you could just go, wow. <laughs> you know, if you're going, wow, you're probably starting to feel it, you know? Like, wow. Here's another one, and it'll be my last kind of intellectual point. The way the brain functions to process information and generate consciousness uh, relies heavily on what are, called, what are called brain waves, these patterns of oscillation or patterns of synchronized firing on a time scale, like two beats per second. That would be a kind of slow brain wave. 50 beats per second would be a faster brain wave and a pretty common one. And there are brain waves that are up to 100 or so beats per second of neurons, millions of neurons firing simultaneously on a really, really, really tight time scale. Why does the brain do that? Why does the brain have brain waves? Huh? Well, one functional benefit of that, and therefore probably a kind of reason, um, you know, in terms of how it evolved, as you may have heard the saying, neurons that fire together, wire together. Well, firing together needs to happen within a few milliseconds, a few thousandths of a second, simultaneous. And then that is the a primary basis for learning. Um, and the formation of, um, it because when two neurons fire almost simultaneously, that sends effectively little signals that um, generate little processes, physical mechanical processes that start to increasingly associate those particular neurons together, including at that particular synapse. All right. So point is, bottom line in, for a moment of learning to occur, including very simple stuff like, whoa, step back when it hurts or step forward when it smells good. Um, we need these waves, which have peaks and valleys, to be circulating essentially throughout the brain so that there are many opportunities for their peaks or, or valleys to coincide and thus fire together so they can wire together. So at a very biological level, the forces, the causes, the factors that are enabling your understanding right now of what I'm saying are widely distributed in your brain and by extension throughout your body. This thought, this idea, this feeling, woof, is the result of 
a vastly distributed network of causes. Okay. Thich Nhat Hanh made these points more eloquently. He writes, Beloved one, you are not something that has been created. You did not come into the realm of being from non-being. You are a wonderful manifestation like a pink cloud on the top of a mountain or a mysterious moonlit night. You are a flowing stream, the continuation of so many wonders. You are not a separate self. You are yourself, but you are also me. You cannot take the pink cloud out of my fragrant tea this morning, and I cannot drink my tea without drinking my cloud. I am in you, and you are in me. If we take me out of you, then you would not be able to manifest as you are manifesting now. If we take you out of me, I would not be able to manifest as I am manifesting now. We cannot manifest without one another. We have to wait for each other in order to manifest together. Having myself grappled with these kinds of teachings, going all the way back to reading Alan Watts and you know, the book in 1974, um, I can just share from my own experience that the most useful way to engage them is emotionally, intuitively, and em embodied. Uh, otherwise, we can get start spinning out into yes, but, or what about, or uh, you know, but you're here, I'm there, you know, the the car is different from the stoplight. And what really is helpful is just to think of it as fuzzy, <laughs> that the boundaries are fuzzy, they're soft, they blur together, they swirl together, and uh, some of the factors. And, and so what we have is we have, in effect, as I write and talk, eddies in the stream. We have swirling patterns, some of which have a lot of stability, like a star has swirled together and usually will last three, four, five billion years, a lot of them, uh, including our own, more or less. And then it gradually changes into something else. Other phenomena are much quicker you know, they arise, they pass away much more rapidly. So it's just okay to understand that. But the boom, the useful thing is what is it like for you to realize that, you know, some large percentage, well over half of the atoms in your body were not in your body a year ago. <laughs> and... <laughs> You too are a slow eddy in the stream of reality. What's it like to realize that so many of your thoughts that seem so precious are not your own? It's not that evil beings are inserting thoughts into you. This is not psychosis. It's just simply that, wow, so much of what I take to be me is, um, is a continuation is a is a continuation of various, in effect, waves of other people and other influences passing through me. Um, you know, I carry my friends with me. I carry the effects of my enemies with me. Right? I I live out into them in the world. Well, what's that like? What's it like to feel that? The Buddhist teaching is that when we really get this, we lighten up and we cling less and love more. The takeaway for me from um, you know the retreat I mentioned before we began formally tonight. We live in relationship, and so much of what ails the world is we act like we don't. We act like we're not. We act like our bodies are not actually frail and vulnerable, and really rely upon constant regeneration and nurturance and good treatment to the extent that we can have that. You know, we, we act like we don't affect other people, but we swirl into them and really affect them. 
some of the biggest mistakes in my own life in relationships have been to underestimate my impact on other people, even if my intentions in some ways were good, albeit perhaps confused, but good intentions, but woof, landed hard on other people. You know? oh. when, you, when you have more of a feeling for the edges softening, boundaries softening, you know, it's wise and it's peaceful. So I'd like to read to you a little passage from my book, Neurodharma, that had to do with an experience I had while canoeing down the, uh, the Green River in Utah. This won't take that long. And then I'll open it up and see what you have to say about all this. Two friends and I once took canoes down the Green River in Utah paddling and drifting for days before joining the Colorado River on its way to the Grand Canyon. I'd never spent so much time on a river and became mesmerized by the eddies swirling through it. Some were standing waves above a boulder. Others were whirlpools we skirted, and many were transient circular ripples on the surface. They were all dynamic and beautiful, and a deep metaphor for many things. Broadly defined, an eddy is a patterning of something that is stable for a time and then disperses. A cloud is an eddy of the atmosphere. An argument is an eddy in a relationship, and a thought is an eddy in the stream of consciousness. One afternoon, we saw dark storm clouds piling up in the distance, sparks of lightning flashing inside them, finally dropping a torrent of rain. Then one waterfall after another appeared on the stony cliffs above us, shooting out onto the river, itself a vast kind of eddy, flowing through dark red sandstone banks formed from the shifting sediments of ancient seas. Some eddies change more slowly than others. The storm passed in a few hours, but some of the marks it left in sandstone could last for thousands, perhaps millions of years. From my canoe, I saw swirling currents passing over golden rocks worn smooth by time, and then a leaf carried along, and then a fly landing on the leaf. Eddies in eddies in eddies. Compared with a cloud, your body is a slow eddy. Still, most of the atoms in it today will be gone in a year and replaced by new ones. All of our experiences rest upon eddies of information represented by eddies of neural activity. Thoughts are quicksilver eddies of mind and matter, while the traces they can leave in memory last longer until the eddying body itself passes away. All eddies disperse eventually. Whether in the mind or the Mississippi, all eddies have the same nature. Impermanent, compounded, interdependent, and empty. To function, the body and its mind must try to stabilize what is changing, to unify what is made of parts, and to partition what is connected. It's necessary to try but we will inevitably, continually, poignantly fail. Craving or clinging to any particular eddy is therefore a certain prescription for suffering. So love the eddy and be the stream. Let go into the larger streaming of consciousness let go of the eddies that have passed on by a minute ago, a year and more ago, and come into the present. And let go of each new eddy of experience as soon as it arises. Consider this teaching from Ajahn Chah. If you let go a little, you will have a little peace. If you let go a lot, you will have a lot of peace. If you let go completely, you will will be completely peaceful.
I find that people, and certainly myself, are helped by, you know, kind of two kinds of teachings. Some kinds are very concrete and immediately applicable. Like, oh, you know, don't use harsh tone <laughs> as best you can in your relationships. Oh, that's pretty clear. What do we mean harsh? I can apply that. Oh, stop interrupting people. Or as someone pointed out to me a moment ago, and I'm going to implement that and there's complications about it. For just I'm gonna I'm gonna implement it. You know, have more quotes quotes from women. Oh, okay, good, right on. That's one kind of teaching: concrete, implementable, deliverable, actionable, great stuff. And you know, I tend to kind of emphasize that as a longtime psychotherapist and a naturally pragmatic and kind of practical person. And Wow, so much of the deepest teachings of the Buddha, they're, they're so profound and penetrating, they're not immediately actionable in some kind of obvious way. And that's okay. That's really okay. It's okay to respect the teaching of profoundly developed people and to feel like right now I get about 5% of it. That's okay. Tomorrow it'll be 7%. In a year, it'll be 25. You know, it's like that. Stay with it. This is the kind of teaching this is about interbeing, interdependence, you know, the kind of the softening of boundaries, the releasing of the contractions of self, and a, a natural opening out naturally into profound, heart touched compassion for other beings. You realize in the teachings I quoted, of Ubuntu from Africa last, last week, uh, I am because you are. We are because they are. When you really get that and feel that through these teachings of softening boundaries and interdependence and interbeing, um, when you really get that, how could we deliberately hurt another person? It's just your being almost recoils from doing that as you rest in this broader sense of relatedness, which you might explore with some of the more challenging people in your life. Okay. So I've seen um, some, you know, really beautiful, beautiful questions um, and comments coming in through the chat. You don't need to use the chat if you don't want to. You might want to take a look at it. Um, I thought about just sharing what I've shared with you tonight and then really kind of Opening, opening it up, um, getting your take, and and um, you know, seeing uh, and hearing what what you have to say. So you're, you feel free to comment there in the chat. I've seen two people raise their hands so far, um, Sarah and Tony. Tony, uh, yeah, thank you for your comments already. Hi, Madison. Hi, Farah. Farah, you had your hand up first. I saw, and you probably lost that. So I'm going to go with you. And as always, I tell this to people. Um, when you, when you have a question, try to have it related to what we're talking about and try to bring, help bring it down to earth and um, you know have something of general interest. Okay, Farah, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Yep, great. Thank you so much for your beautiful teaching. I really appreciate that. And I always learn from you. Um, one thing that I, I it, this is very connected Thing to me uh, about that interconnectedness and mm. vastness. This is so beautiful. Uh, but there is something going on between my heart and mind uh, that in my brain, because I did a lot of meditations and, you know, mindfulness practice, I can bring that vastness, unity, calmness, quietness. But when it comes to love, it's a whole different ballgame. And no matter how much I dealt with my past, I let go, I forgive and did all of those things. But that openness, it doesn't happen. So I just wanted to see what your uh, guidance for me, that how I can really can bring the mind and heart together. Mm. Yeah. Because uh, I think that vastness and oneness is one thing. Feeling love is a 
to me is a whole different ball game or challenge for me, basically. Feeling loved, the receiving of love, you're saying, Farah? To be in love, you know, to see that vastness as a love, to be yeah. and receive the love. I just, you know, I feel myself being very lovely. Everybody feels that they are able to receive love from me, but probably is the me who cannot receive the love. That's my conclusion. And no matter how much I know that Eddie and try to soften and try to let it go, but it doesn't let go. So now what? Ah, very, yeah, I got it. Um, well, uh, I, I, I'm going to offer two suggestions that are at opposite ends of the psycho-spiritual spectrum. The first suggestion is it might be if, if you're able in meditation to have a, 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 a stable resting in what could be described as an open heart, there's a lovingness in you, right? You're, there's a caring, you know, you find your own words. Is that true in meditation? You can find that? No, that's what I'm saying. When you're you, saying openness, I'm able to see that openness, I got it. Yeah, see the yeah. vastness, but I'm not able to get in touch with love. And yet people experience you as being loving, right? Yes. But you're saying you don't experience what you would call you know, the, the range of, I'll call it caring. Compa can you experience compassion? Can you experience kindness? Toward myself or toward the, in general? Uh, all the above, but definitely toward other people. Mm, toward other people, I have uh, a lot of compassion, love, connection. So what's the issue again? You feel love for others, right? But not for myself, yes. Do you feel their love for you? Maybe you, that's the that's the problem. Yeah, and 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 I thank others for being patient. As you know, Far and I just walked through this. Maybe it took me longer than it should have to really grasp it. But what I hear you say, Farah, is that the way I would put it is that you have a hard time for whatever reasons in your history experiencing, um, feeling cared about on a range that runs from, uh, as you may have heard me say, feeling included seen, appreciated, liked, and loved, right? You don't experience it. You know it. You're not psychotic, but you don't feel it. Is that what you're saying? Just the love part. I see, hmm. I feel the appreciation. I feel the connection. I feel now belonging, but I don't feel loved. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. What's the difference for you between feeling liked and feeling loved? Can you feel liked? Liked and loved is just a um, presentness to me. And uh, I don't know what to say, to be honest with you. It's yeah. all about uh, kind of uh, blah, 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 but I don't know how to bring it in me. You don't feel cared about? Like they care about you? They do, yes. Do you feel it? I feel it. You feel cared about, mm -hmm. but you don't feel what you call loved. That's right. So Farah, I'm going to do something I don't usually do because I know we're at the rub and you've been grappling with this for a long time. And I, I don't want to take a lot more time with this with the group as a whole. Um, but what I'd like you to do is to email me Use the contact form on my website, and I'll get into communication with you specifically about this, okay? Because I want to help you feel this. And we're at the rub, and I, I get it. This has been this way for a while. It's this way for reasons, and I want, I'd want i like to get to them. Okay, will you do that? Yeah, sure. All right, good. Good for you. Be brave. All right, good. And um, great. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to keep going. So bows to you. Okay, Sarah, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Talking about relationality, the relational field. All right. 
Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed the talk and the meditation. It's my first time. Oh, good. We went for the deep. This is kind of more fuzzy and vague than I usually am. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to connect a couple of dots. I just wanted to share my reflection. Please. Um, you said that some of our suffering comes from not like cutting ourselves off and not being in a relationship. If I understood you correctly, yeah, that's right. And for me, the way I experience it actually is the suffering is trying to make sense of the relationships, like not necessarily like the cutting off, but like where I stand maybe, or like what the quality is. And I feel, feel suffering in that. So I don't know if anybody relates to that. <laughs> oh. um, and then I just watched one of your talks on letting go. And so this, this talk became a little fuzzy for me because I feel like it makes it more difficult, like to let go if I'm feeling connected. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to, and I need to think about this some more, but I just, that was another thought in my head that I don't know if you want to comment on that, or I should think about it some more. <laughs> That's mm. Wanted to say thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you for bringing it up. Um, you know, does it help you let go of someone that your inner wisdom tells you, yeah, I should let go? You know, it just it seems clear. Like, does it help you let go or disengage, you know, step back from and so forth of someone when you feel more connected with others? Yeah, I do feel that when I'm connected to others, that it does make it a little bit easier to let go of people who shouldn't be in my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's kind of it more, you know, when we feel like there are all these stakes in one person, we've really invested in one person, there are a lot of eggs in that one basket. Mm -hmm. It just becomes so much easier to help ourselves deal with the anxiety of separation and loss. Um, if we have a strong feeling, meanwhile, of connectedness with others, even if they're not soulmate type people, and that person might have been, but still just feeling related, feeling connected, resourced, you know, socially, interpersonally can help us um, be more autonomous in a, in a really good, strong way. But we are letting go, though. In, if if we may choose to, yeah. And but, that is like the severing of a connection, kind of. If that is appropriate, I mean, there are definitely people where, um, you you know, where basically you realize to yourself, oh, okay, this person's not evil, and you know, we're gonna shrink, we're gonna resize the scope of our relationship. We're going to spend less time together, or we're not going to go drinking together, or I'm not going to invite them to my, you know, <laughs> my home anymore. We're not going to sleep together, whatever. We're not going to, I'm not going to loan them any more money. I'm not going to listen to them rant about Donald Trump. I mean, whatever it might be, you know, we resize the relationship. That's a natural process. People do it with us too, right? So yeah, and it's okay to do that. Yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you. So much. Oh yeah, deep, great stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So, Tony, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Um, great. Hi, Rick. Hey Thanks there. for this evening. So I'm up here in, near Montreal, and I'm so grateful that you have them on free Zoom meetings on Wednesday nights. Oh, good. Uh, I just want to share with other people before I get to this evening. Um, I began a healing journey nine years ago when my body gave up crashed. I, I hit major depression. And I've been, uh, you know, doing the usual stuff, but also um, an advocate for myself and looking for ways myself to heal. And one of the first books recommended was your book, Rewiring Your Brain for Happiness, which um, when you're in a depression is very hard to concentrate and focus. But yeah you had your foundations of wellness that was starting. And so I took part in those back then. Um, and I've also taken the mindfulness-based stress reduction course. Okay. And in 2014, 
um, I was seeing someone that said it had me do the Kristen Neff self compassion, yeah. which I failed. I didn't uh -huh. even understand what self compassion was, and so since then I've done the mindfulness based self compassion um, course. All to say that uh, you pick up bits and pieces along the way from different teachers, from different books, etc., and. Um, and so I, I've changed. I'm stronger. I'm wiser. I'm more compassionate to others. And I'm more compassionate with myself as a result of going through this healing journey. Yeah, you've been through it. And so is there yeah. a question in this? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm going to say how it related to tonight is this afternoon, uh, about six hours ago, I found out that my dog sitter has a baseball size tumor in her right breast. So it was a huge mm -hmm. shock. And uh, for me, you know, this whole concept of we are in interconnected, we are one, is became really real for me tonight. You know, when you're saying it, rubbing up to next people and uh, where do we start, where do we end? Um, I, I really, uh, during the beginning of this, I was praying for her because there's I can't heal it I'm not a doctor but I can pray for her I can support her and the whole idea of we are one is by the work I do to help her is helping me okay great you know, I'm feeling that that connectedness and compassion and um, you know when you were talking about the three truths everything is connected yes nothing lasts Yes, hopefully in her case, it will last longer um, than she's concerned about now. And you are not alone. You know, we're not alone. I'm there for her. And uh, yeah. so it really resonated tonight. That's if great, I, Tony. I'm, I'm not hearing a question. And I'm yeah. hearing a lot of beautiful sharing. Yeah, so thank you. Hearing to, to say that it really resonated when we think of people that are ill and how we are connected to them. Yeah through our relationships. Oh, yeah. No, thank you. It's very tender. Bows back. 